Um, you know, in this career, I have uh, achieved a few things, uh, not as many as I'd like, but I consider this a check mark uh, when it comes to the bucket list. I have finally convinced my friend Rob Feeder to agree to an interview. This is like, um, I, I don't even know what this is like. This is this is the holy grail to some extent. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for doing this. It's great to be here with you, Steve. Um, I want you to tell people the story of the Walter Cronkite fan club. <laughs> I had always had an interest in news and in media, and I was particularly fascinated by this guy on the CBS Evening News mm -hmm. and the guy who brought us the news of the Kennedy assassination, men landing on the moon. Virtually every major story of the second half of the 20th century, right. he was the guy there. And when I was 14 years old, I, I wrote him a letter because I wanted to hear back from him. I thought the coolest thing would be to get a letter from Walter Cronkite, sure. my idol. And so I wrote him a letter and I told him I had started a fan club for him. And we had hundreds of members and we did a monthly newsletter and we're, we're all big fans of his and we wanted to let him know. Now, before you pay this off, I want people to realize this is pre-internet. This, right. this is a letter these are letters. Yes. This is organizing all of this by mail and return mail. Yes. Um, so it's a big deal. And Every, everything was analog. But, but I should admit that at the time I wrote that initial letter to him, none of it was true. Okay. Uh, I was. I just wanted to get a letter back from him. Okay. And I get a letter back from him. That part I didn't know and I liked. <laughs> well, <laughs> I wanted to do it. Sure. But he, so he wrote back and he said, Dear Mr. Feeder, I'm humbled in the face of but grateful for your kindness towards me. As members of the Walter Cronkite fan club, I know in reality you're paying tribute to the work of all the men and women of CBS News to deliver the news fairly wow. without fear or favor. Wow. Please give my warmest regards to all the members of the club. Sincerely, Walter Cronkite. You must have read that 10,000 times. It was unbelievable, yes. When did it yes. hit you that you then had to start the club? Well, I used that letter. <laughs> I made 1,000 copies of right. his letter, right. which was an endorsement of a club that actually didn't exist up until That's that point. That's fantastic. But, every, but here's the most important thing. Everything that I told him in that initial letter came true. We did have more than 1,000 members. For the next five or six years, I published a monthly newsletter about him. It was essentially a blog, but it was purely analog. I mean, it was typed on a manual, uh, an electric typewriter sure. and duplicated and folded and put in envelopes, which were addressed and stamped. Uh, these are all They were self-sealing. You probably had to send out for a second tongue it was, after it, a while. It was a major undertaking, but I loved it. And it made me really, it made me, not only it started a lifelong friendship and mentorship with the most trusted man in America. Sure. Which is no small thing. Huge. But it put me on the path to my whole career, which was covering the media. My interest was not in ever being on the air, but but being close enough to watch it, to to and to find out things about it and to share it. That was my life's ambition. Was anybody doing that in journalism? I mean, you had the the legendary 40s, Dorothy Kilgallens and huh. people like that who wrote the gossip sheets in Hollywood about the business. But was anybody covering journalism, TV, radio um, in the 60s and 70s of note? Well, by the time I graduated from journalism school... Northwestern? Uh, Northwestern. The The... the premier radio TV critic in Chicago was Gary Deeb. And he was a pioneer in the sense, I mean, critics up until that point essentially were reviewing programs or writing personality profiles. That was the job by and large of a right. TV critic at a newspaper. Right. He incorporated the news part of it, the going behind the scenes, the the revealing who the executives were who were making the decisions, sure, um, explaining the ratings in a way that the the public had never seen before. So he was really very business oriented. In fact, he did very little actual reviewing of programming, even though he was he had the title. Of TV so you may have been the first media news guy in the country, of note. I th of note, he was nationally syndicated, and he he had gone. He had been at the Chicago Tribune for uh, seven years, and the Sun-Times hired him away. That's when the two newspapers and the battle between them in this town was so robust. Yeah, that you had people crossing the streets. You had big money deals. There were agents and offices. 
In fact, one of the perks that the Sun-Times gave Gary Deeb that lured him over was a leg man, a leg man, a full-time assistant, a reporter assigned to him. Up to that point, those were only for people like Mike Royko, in sure. news columnists who actually had people out there gathering information. Chasing down stories, returning calls, all that all stuff. stuff. Yeah, handling, yeah, handling all that stuff. And Gary, as far as I know, was the first TV critic to get a leg man. He knew me because when I was at Northwestern and earlier, he had been among the recipients of this Walter Cronkite newsletter. So he knew there was this guy who had this crazy interest from Chicago. So that's why I was hired at the Sun-Times initially, to work with him. Now, when you are a kid in the 70s and a young adult in the 70s, um, WLS, the Big 89, the rock era explodes. Were you a fan of music radio enough to understand how big a deal it was at that point? It, it really goes back further than that. I had not yet turned four years old when WLS radio uh, switched on May 2nd, 1960, to mm-hmm. the new sound, to Top 40. And so I, my whole life, essentially, and I grew up in this market, so my whole life, I'm, I'm not aware of a time when WLS wasn't big, yeah, important. Sure. And I loved it. And you loved everything about it. And I was one of those kids who came down and peered in the window and saw the, the DJs behind the glass. Yeah, they actually, actually had, like, at the Stone Container Building, they had a viewing area where you could go in and people could sit and they could watch the jocks on the air. That's right. It was sort of like going to the zoo, only you were watching <laughs> these stars that you'd grown up with, where sure. you're seeing them, in, you knew their voices and you're seeing them talk and it's live and... And maybe during a break, they'd look at you or come out or sign sure. an autograph. It was incredible. And and that was a very influential... I mean, there are people on the air now who remember those experiences. Sure. People like Bob Surratt. He remembers standing at the glass as a kid. Right. And then he becomes the guy in the big seat. Uh, th- that was that was part of the magic of, of being in Chicago at the time. So I, I always loved WLS and... When I was hired at the Sun-Times, a short time after I started, I was given a, an opportunity to write a weekly column about radio. The one day a week that Gary's column didn't appear in the, during weekdays was Monday. So on Monday, they turned it over to me, and I could write about local radio. I thought the greatest thing would be if I could ever just meet Larry Lujak. Right. That would be like the coolest thing ever. Right. And here I am, given an opportunity to write a radio column in Chicago. So the first thing I, the first column, 1982, the first radio column I ever wrote with a byline for the Sun-Times was about a TV commercial that Larry had just shot starring Rodney Dangerfield. Mm -hmm. Now, let's stop for just a second, Steve. How many of these things, a TV commercial (laughs) for a radio personality... Of that stature, a multi-million right. dollar, WLS was so, I mean, it was huge. And music and 50,000 watts. Well, it was massive. I mean, I when I was speaking with John Guerin about this, who you and I both know is one of the all-time great managers in this business absolutely. and visionaries and absolutely. absolutely zero ego. But to me, that Lou Jack, Landecker, et cetera, lineup, Fred Winston, all those guys, um, they were the not ready for primetime players on the radio. Oh, yeah. They were that big. They were bigger than the Not Ready for Primetime players. They were gigantic yeah. stars in Chicago, but Huge. because of the signal, they were gigantic stars around the country. That's right. Huge. It was huge. The ratings were huge. The revenue was huge. The influence that these people had on multiple generations of radio performers to follow, and the fact that they kept renewing and kept refreshing, they kept remaining relevant. Sure. You know, the the initial incarnation of, of WLS as a top four, well, we need to pay lip service at least for a minute to the illustrious um, reputation of WLS before 1960. It was on the map then. It sure. was the Prairie Farmer Station. Yeah, the barn was, dance. The, the national barn dance was enormously important. The, the Hindenburg explosion right, 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 was right. a WLS reporter covering it. Right. So it was a it was a historic legacy station prior to that time, but what we think of as the golden age was what started in 1960. 
and no one personified that initial burst more than Dick Biondi, being the he he, he was the nighttime personality when WLS debuted in 1960, and played the Beatles, broke the Beatles, broke the Beatles, and dominated nighttime listening across America, right. not just Chicago or the Midwest. It was an enormous reach, and he was enormously influential. And, and what people don't understand now in this era of everybody has a podcast and conversations go on incessantly, the talent it takes to be entertaining for five and ten second bursts multiple times an hour to even be memorable. And people would say, I heard Beyondy. They didn't say, oh, I heard the new record last night on WLS. That's right. And then later on, Lou Jack, Landecker, Surratt, right. Winston, all of those guys. Um, all right, let me, let me go back to the Lou Jack thing for a second. He agrees to the interview? Yeah, he did, and it it turned out great. On the phone or in person? Well, th this was uh, th this was focused on just this TV commercial. Right. So it was a fairly narrow subject, but it set the groundwork, and because I had gotten to know him, I convinced him to let me do a full-blown profile of him. And so about a year later, that was when we really bonded. I spent a long time talking to him. He opened up to me in a way that he had never done before in an interview. He talked about his, his um, struggles with alcohol, his feelings about religion, what was really important to him in life, his, how he viewed radio and his audience, things that he had never gone on the record about. And that that was what really bonded us together. But I think and that's one of your that's one of the gifts that you've had through all these years, is you're able to create trust and have people drop their guard for two reasons. One is because you're authentic. You don't write hit pieces. You never wrote hit pieces. You wrote the truth. You gathered facts and you wrote the truth. But secondarily, you're someone in the room that you can sit down with who you don't have an adversarial relationship with. And when I think about the egos that have come through town, of course, not me, but the egos, <laughs> the egos that have come through town who are trying to make a name for themselves um, and, you know, thinking, well, I can go on the air tomorrow and say, I beat up Rob Peter. Mm. Um, yeah. It's very cool to hear that Larry wasn't one of those guys. No, Larry was great. Larry was, he was always great. And he was such a, well, let me back up a minute. When he came to Chicago, 1967, he was 27 years old. He was basically a journeyman disc jockey, born in Iowa, started his career in Boise, Idaho, and had worked maybe half a dozen markets uh, from from Boise to Boston when he got the call to come to Chicago to do overnights. Uh, he knew what he was walking into. This was a, a huge market. Sure. And he had to differentiate himself. And that was how he refined the act, the character, the persona. Was he being himself? Yes. Was he authentic? Yes. But it was an exaggerated version. Yeah. So that he was presenting himself, what, what endeared him to so many people was he was so genuine and authentic. He was usually in a bad mood. He he hated authority. <laughs> he, tell me how much of this sounds familiar yeah, to you, talking about me? Mr. Cochran. And, and in so doing, he not only endeared himself to listeners, he opened up a whole new avenue of presentation for what had been a pretty standard. I mean, even John Guerin admitted you were supposed to be cheerful and upbeat. Sure. And, and, and Lou Jack even commented there was one studio he worked in with a huge um, sign over the microphone that said smile <laughs> with an exclamation point. Well, that's the opposite of him. Right. So he came in and he was perfectly suited to the time because by the late 60s, it was a time of, of, of rebellion, of, of protest, of of divisions in the country, of course, and and he perfectly uh, personified the the spirit there, and so that was markedly different. In some ways, he put, I mean, Biondi had left WLS in 1963, but he did come back, and by the time he came back, Biondi, I'm talking about, to WCFL in the late 60s, his act was considered passe, right. And Lou Jack was the new thing. Lou Jack is the one who sort of supplanted Biondi as the star. For the next 20 years, Lou Jack owned 
young adult radio in Chicago. He dominated the demographic of listeners between 18 and 49 as no one had before or since. Yeah, and I would say that there's a guy in New York who became a national figure who's in the Radio Hall of Fame named Don Imus. Right. And Imus was about the same age as Larry, but Imus always credited uh, Robert W. Morgan as his idol. Imus who I thought was tremendous. He's one of the guys I analyzed coming up. Yeah. Imus stole from Larry. Yeah. Imus became the grumpy old man of New York. Larry had already done it. Beyond he opened the door for a lot of people. Sure did. Lou, Lou Jack opened the door for Landecker. The idea was that you could be yourself. You could be a much bigger personality than the music or just the, the role of disc jockey yeah, yeah, yeah. as it had been. Brandmeier, who was... Jonathan Brandmeier, who was strongly influenced by both of them, said, Lou Jack made it possible to be yourself. Landecker remembered that it was showbiz. Landecker was all showbiz. His production, his energy, his creativity, even the way he had the engineer adjust the microphone specifically for him so that it had a certain sound, um, that's a great summation. I've never talked to Johnny about it, but that's a perfect summation of those I, two guys. I thought that was an absolutely, I you know, and and Rush Limbaugh credited Larry Lujak and to a lesser extent Landerker, but particularly Lujak. Every time you heard Rush Limbaugh shuffle papers or kick over a garbage can <laughs> or pause too long or or puff himself up as being talent on loan from God, yeah, yeah. that was 100% Lujak. Luge, but but Lujek did it as humor. Rush at some point started out as an and started act, to but, believe it. Yeah, he so that evolved. And and by the way, Lujek uh, despised the fact that he did anything to inspire Rush. I yeah, mean, yeah, yeah. That was not a source of pride for no, him. No, 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 no. There were many others who he was proud to have inspired, but not not Rush. Um, so Landecker brought it to a new level, and and in the seventies. Uh, Landecker and I, I mentioned Bob Surratt before. They were the linchpins of that. In addition to Larry, Larry was sort of the the old the older uh, older brother figure and father figure would be wrong, but uh, he sort of kept to himself. Surratt and Landecker treated WLS like it was there for their fun. Yeah. they were there to have fun. Well, they were they were in their twenties. It was like yeah. playground time. Yeah. These were kids who had so many resources, such a big audience, and and a tremendous amount of talent that they were encouraged to to develop. If you look at the guys that um, either jumped too early, or not, well, I shouldn't say too early, they jumped for the right reasons. Fred was a guy who was a huge presence in Chicago, but I think people remember him for CFL maybe as much as they remember him for WLS. Um you had news stars. You had a major news operation yeah. here at WLS. Yeah. Um, you had you had Les Grobstein doing right. sports. These figures yeah. that were here perennially. But the goalposts for the absolute peak are, are Larry and, and and Landecker, right? Yeah, they were. That was the golden age of WLS. That's what that's what so many people of our generation remember so fondly. That so was, if you go with transitional things, Beyondy begets. Uh, Landecker and Lou Jack. Right. Um, how does Stephen Gary fit into this? It is it is a continuum. They are exa well. I have to say, as an aside, I, I always thought that Gary Meyer's delivery was patterned on Lou Jack. Same and, here. And he grew up here, and I have no doubt. And uh, but Steve Dahl created uh, started something in Detroit, which undeniably influenced. Howard Stern, undeniably. Absolutely, Absolutely. 100%. And, and went on to influence many others. He he would not have been, a, his act would not have been possible were it not for people like Lou Jack and Landecker who opened the door. Um, but it was the next iteration of it. It was the next generation of it. What we didn't know was that it would be the end, that I guess you could say man cow was the last I wouldn't put Man Cow in that team picture. Well <laughs> wait, it's your interview, isn't it? I want to be I want to be fair. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. At least historically speaking, yeah. you could you could make the case The that, last shock. Yeah. Um 
But the doll thing was revolutionary, and that once again changed radio. Now, his relationship with WLS was rocky, to say the least, um, a checkered career, given the ups and downs and so forth. But his some of his much of his best work is related to the years that he was on this frequency. And that just- uh, no, yeah, to my mind, there's no question. And what you said about Howard's an important point to make because um, Steve did his thing the way he did his thing. Howard comes through Detroit at W4. He becomes aware of Steve. He goes back to, I think it was in D.C. at that point, maybe. And the Howard Stern show develops from there. And I don't know the Howard, I mean... I think Howard's given Steve some credit through the years, but he never would have dropped his guard to say, Dahl made me. But Dahl influenced a ton of people. When I was yeah. in high school, I listened to Steve and Gary. I thought, I've never heard anything like this. And they always sounded like the coolest kids on the bus that you were sitting behind and you wanted to hear everything they said. Yeah. And something would happen and you couldn't wait to tune in to hear their take on it. Right. Uh, that, that, that is remarkable. That is a remarkable hold on an audience. And, I mean, their following was as devoted as as Dick Biondi's was 25 years earlier. Yeah, no question about it. And they could turn out thousands at, at appearances and at concerts and things. And, and when Chicago was the absolute best radio market in the country for years and years and years, the loop, Jimmy DeCastro's loop, Larry Wirtz's loop, if you will, uh, comes up, Brandmeier comes in, changes that world. But it would be a mistake not to remember Robert Murphy in his act and the morning wars that occurred here because this was the epicenter for radio. Oh, yeah. The, I mean, the early 80s, before AM essentially um, became, Went talk. What, became what it is now, Yes, <laughs> uh, it, was, it was phenomenal. And, and, and WGCI and Tom Joyner and Doug Banks and you're right Robert Murphy and the 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 st- Eddie and Jobo on yeah. V96 radio was so that was the last time that radio mattered and it was exciting and everybody listened to it and yeah. and there was money and there were billboards and TV commercials and and it was showbiz it, writ large yeah and the loop um, was the um, the big 89 for the 80s and early 90s um, and maybe even less manageable uh, with talent that was harder to uh, to control. But it's one of the reasons that Chicago has such really personal relationships with so many of these personalities, Kevin Matthews, people yeah. like that, um, because radio in this town, I would argue, mattered more than any other city. L.A., the film industry, New right. York, theater, right? television to some extent. It's not like radio didn't matter there, but the most talented people came through Chicago. And they had the, they had the biggest platform and the most freedom and the most attention and these 50,000-watt signals that would essentially cover the, the whole country were, were undeniable. So um, Steve and Gary, uh, to some extent, begat Johnny, even though Johnny was more coming from the the Larry Landecker era, you get into the talk time. And um, I've never thought that Don and Roma have gotten the credit they deserved. And it may have been a timing thing, but Don and Roma were an absolute force. And Don in particular, I always felt had a good way. It wasn't funny, but he had a good way of making sure that he could deliver the news and politics in the middle of a full service local show. That's true. They were great. I, I, you know, Don was an outstanding talent, and he was a radio guy first. He right. did the music formats first. He was not an ideologue or right. a wannabe or a, a, a political figure. He came into it uh, and evolved into a, a, a terrific talk show host. And even though he, he did espouse a strong point of view, he was fair and he did acknowledge. And he, the, the whole idea of bringing Roma in in the first place was an attempt to try to balance, to have someone push back so that it wasn't just one guy. It was it was a, a, a conversation or a debate. And he really did it well. He was uh, a very worthy successor to the morning hosts who came before him. But by that point, everything had changed. The economic model of the business had changed. Consolidation had had resulted in loss of local control, and 
the 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 bottom just fell out and and that's that's why covering the radio business today w- is really not not even sustainable because no. it it it's not even a part of the lives of younger people the way it was for us right the the interesting thing too is radio is still heard or used by more than 90% of the country every day but it's so fractionalized they're not staying for long they're popping in and out, and they don't have those ties to the personalities like they used to. Right. Um, I consider what I do to be the last sane talk show in America because everything else is so tribal. Have you registered that yet? Um, no, I think I'm going to do it right now. The last send my sane. people out. The last sane talk show in America. But um, it's not. Ex- it doesn't roll off the tongue like Super Jock, but you know <laughs> it'll. <laughs> Maybe I'll hit up my second book, but. Um, <laughs> If you were to sum up the impact of WLS on Chicago, I don't even know if you can, what would you say? I would say that it it was a it was a, a collection of talent that managed to unite hundreds of thousands of people in Chicago and provide um a common meeting place, a common meeting ground, and a common experience so that today you hear a song or a voice or even a name, and it evokes so much emotion and so much feeling in the people whose lives it affected. And that was what attracted me to covering it, that this was something so powerful and pervasive and meaningful and influential that... I couldn't think of anything more exciting to to delve into and to devote my my career to. Beautifully said, and a great summation of WLS on its 100th birthday. Um, I've convinced Rob to do this once. The next time he comes back, he's going to tell me all the stories about the people that sucked. <laughs> <laughs> but I love the positivity <laughs> about it and and the the memory lane walk because it matters. And it's uh, it's a happy birthday to WLS. Thank you for doing this. Thank you, Steve. Great to be with you.